So welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed lunch. Lunch was brought to you by Rotomaker. Uh, so thanks to Rotomaker and, and definitely visit their booth. They're giving out these uh, cool knickknacks. So definitely go over there and get your very own. Um, so for uh, our next uh, bit of business, uh, we're gonna hear from Skip Rizzo, uh, who's a PhD, Director of Medical Virtual Reality at the Institute of Creative Technologies at USC. And he's here today to educate us on VR in healthcare. Um, before we, we get to Skip, his talk is being sponsored by AMD Radeon. And for more than 45 years, uh, our sponsor has driven innovation in high-performance computing graphics and visualization technologies, and they deliver immense, immense visual power with unmatched technological innovation to set the bar for enabling premium experiences for creators and consumers. So, you know, pay attention to AMD if you can at some point today. That would be really great. Be sure to check them out in our Annex display as well, and, and during the, the break later and during the cocktail party that's coming later. So, for our talk now, um, and. I just hope you all, before I, I get into the actual specifics, I hope you can see the DNA of what the summit is all about. You're all somehow connected to visual effects, but the speakers are giving you different ways to see the world through that lens. So each one of the speakers has been curated for the very possibility that you will take away some brand new way of looking at your world. And so with that, I wanna introduce uh, Skip, who is an award-winning clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist. Skip conducts research on virtual reality systems targeting treatment and rehabilitation of those with PTSD, traumatic brain injury, autism, ADHD, Alzheimer's, stroke, and other clinical conditions. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Skip Rizzo. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the um, AMD and the sponsors and organizers for inviting me here today. Um, as soon as my slides come up. Um, what I'm gonna do in 30 minutes, I'm gonna try to talk as fast as I can. I'm gonna try to, try to cover as much as I can on how virtual reality can be applied for clinical applications, areas of mental health, rehabilitation, some medicine applications, and so on. So. If I talk fast and you can't understand me, uh, just raise your hand and I'll try to slow down. Um, so with that said, what I'll try to cover is a little bit about mental health. I'll do an intro to VR, mental health, psych treatment, virtual assessment and rehab. If I have time, we'll talk about pain management and intelligent virtual humans that are applied in clinical applications. So with that said, let me start off with a little intro. You may have heard of the USC Institute for Creative Technology, but just real quick, we're um, part of USC, but we're also sponsored a good bit by the Army. And when the Army decided they wanted a virtual reality research institute um, set up somewhere, they wanted it in LA so we'd have close proximity to Hollywood talent and narrative, game development, special effects, and so on. Um, and so, Essentially, in that building, you have the unholy alliance between Hollywood, the military, and academia. Three <laughs> completely different cultures all thrown together, but somehow we get along and, uh, and we build stuff. I direct the Medical Virtual Reality Research Group, and we address psych, cognitive, motor, and virtual human applications. Here's a little example of what you'll see later, simulation of Iraq or Afghanistan that we use for treating PTSD. I'll explain how we do that in a minute. We also have done resilience training for service members before they go into combat. Um, that's what it looked like six or seven years ago. So you can see the difference in the graphics. But in this case, we took the simulation we built for treating PTSD and embedded with of cognitive function, measures of attention, memory, executive function, multitasking, things that put a person in a functionally relevant environment and then test how they perform, but measuring these specific skills. But we also do things that aren't military related. So this is from back in the 90s. Our lab actually started in 1996, 
right around the start of the first nuclear winter of virtual reality. I heard, you know, there was a lot of hype about VR in the early 90s, and kind of the bottom fell out because uh, the technology wasn't there to deliver on a vision. But we, you know, we hung in there. Anyway, this is a mental rotation, visual, spatial, 3D task that actually showed some real value in assessment and training. And this is what a child sees in a head-mounted display as they turn and look around in a virtual classroom. And this is something we developed to test children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, where we could put, they have to pay attention to what's on the blackboard, but meanwhile, we have distractors. You know, a teacher going to answer the door, little kid just through a paper airplane. Uh, if you look to the left, you'll see a school bus, a car, kids passing notes. So a way to test attention in a functionally relevant environment, but one that we can systematically control so we get a better measure not only the cognitive performance, but how much are they looking around and fidgeting and, and so on. Um, something you can't do with traditional methods. Um, down here you see an example using a precursor to the Microsoft Connect, the Prime Sensor, and basically it's capturing that user without any markers or instrumentation um, and basically putting that user in a game-like environment to do physical therapy after a, you know, a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, try to make the very boring and repetitive process of therapy after some of these you know, really disabling conditions fun and engaging at a low cost and perhaps move it more into the home. Um, taking that same technology, the International Cerebral Palsy Foundation wanted us to do a simple thing. Make it so kids with severe motor impairments with cerebral palsy could play video games. You know, these are kids that aren't so good with a game pad or keyboard. Uh, they get significant motor impairments. So by using this tracking technology, this little girl here, um, first time she ever played a video game in her life, the one movement that she had good motor control of was this move. She could do this reliably and consistently. And we could track that movement with the Kinect and use it to emulate the movement on a keypad. And now we're working with Microsoft to try to extend this across a wider range of games, like say a uh, Forza racer game, car racing game. You're in a wheelchair, if you lean forward, it's like stepping on the accelerator, you lean back, it's like a brake, you shift side to side, you steer. You're not gonna be quite as good as using a wheel or a gamepad, but you can still play the damn game. Anyway, um, Finally, um, our work with virtual humans. Um, we've, one of the big research areas at our center is in developing these types of characters that have some level of AI, voice recognition, natural language processing, credible gesture, facial expression. This is one we built for the School of Social Work for training novice clinicians in how to do a clinical interview. So it's a virtual patient, and I'll just let this play. Good afternoon, Sergeant Castilla. What brings you in today? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. She's been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicided on base last week. Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He wasn't a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. Do you have any plans to hurt yourself? No. It certainly caught my mind, especially lately. I just need it all to stop. Sometimes I can't handle it. So I, I like to say this gives a novice clinician a chance to screw up a bunch with a virtual patient before they get their hands on a live one. Um, the next case is an online agent that's online right now. You can go and interact with them. And this was driven by the military's need to break down barriers to care. Veterans, service members coming back, they don't want to admit they're, they're having a problem. They don't want to go see a shrink, but things are going on. So they could go online and interact with this guy, find out about PTSD, do some light self-assessment with the character. The character asks you questions about what you're experiencing. And then the character can say, well, look, looks like you're having some difficulty. Uh, you want to talk a little more about it? Or if you want, I can pull up a site where you punch in your zip code and I can give you a list of providers in your area. So it's about a toe in the water, not a replacement not a virtual therapist, but a healthcare guide. Now we're applying it with cancer, with HIV, and a couple of other areas. Um, but I'll let him introduce himself. Hopefully we'll get time to see him more later, but in case not, here he is. Well, I'm not a real person, if that's what you're asking. But I'm based on the personality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time. So hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. 
It's a, a safe private place where people can kind of explore their issues. So what is VR? Well, technocentric definition, integration of computing, um, display technology, interface devices, tracking, graphics, all to build simulations that people can become immersed or interact within. Um, I prefer the more human-centric definition, which is simple human-computer interaction. You know, ways for humans to more naturally interact with computers and content we generate. Um, and if we look at how HCI has gone over the last few years, perhaps we can take advantage of the power in these boxes beyond the mouse and the keyboard, not hunting and pecking all the time. Now VR has, we'd like to talk about the three I's, immersion, interactivity, and imagination. You don't need all of them, but sometimes you need at least two. So for example, if you go with immersion, here's a service member wearing a head-mounted display immersed in a marketplace uh, represents Iraq, um, or Afghanistan in this case. So he's in that environment occluded from the outside world. We can also do things with physical therapy. So this has a, what's called a leap motion sensor on the front of an Oculus Rift headset, and now you can see your hands in real time as you interact with digital content. And this is really good, it has the resolution for fine motor control rehab after a stroke or traumatic brain injury. And this is some of the game-based stuff that we're developing now uh, using a couple of hands. And you can see your hand well represented there. And we're trying to, trying to gamify very boring and repetitive activities that are part of doing rehab. Um, interactivity. You don't always have to immerse somebody in a virtual world. Sometimes you can do it on a TV. And so this is a balanced training exercise, like what I was saying about the driving, where she's controlling that little penguin, an open source free game, by shifting side to side, lean forward, lean back to slow down, and interactive in the lab. You don't have to be in a virtual world, but you can still get value out of it. Um, and it doesn't always have to be on a big screen. It's a patient at Rancho Los Amigos practicing a range of motion exercise game with a simple small screen laptop. If you build engaging, involving content, you can get people to participate and maybe do more than they would otherwise. We can also deliver virtual humans on a flat screen monitor, although now we've been putting them in a headset and stereo and they're really pretty compelling. But um, in this case, we built something for the Dan Marino Foundation, which focuses on high functioning autism. And they were interested in helping people to get jobs in this population. And these are folks that oftentimes are very bright, very talented, can do the job, but they got this little thing about social interaction, and it's difficult for them. Um, so we were able to build out six different characters that play the role of a job interviewer. We can have different backgrounds that they get popped in for different jobs. And each character can have three different personalities. So you can set the, this character to be a nice soft touch interviewer, a neutral one, or a hostile interviewer. Um, and so here's this character in this backdrop in soft touch mode. I'm glad you're here. In a minute, we'll get into some questions about the job. But before we do, why don't you just tell me about yourself? And then, um, you know, as the person gets comfortable with that and practices and gets over their anxiety, we can change up the character, or we could use her. We can put a different backdrop in, and we can make her a little bit more cranky. This is an entry-level position. I guarantee there will be things you won't like about this job. <laughs> What's the most important thing you think you're looking for in a job? And if I have time later, I'll talk a little bit about now. We're, we've translated the software to be used at US Vets, a nonprofit downtown at Patriotic Hall for helping young veterans, 18 to 25 year old veterans are at 25% unemployment um, as opposed to like 16% in the general population. So really trying to help them get a, get a leg up. Um, and um, anyway, uh, maybe we'll have time. Anyway, um, now the best metaphor for how we apply all these kinds of cool things in mental health, rehab, medicine is aviation simulation. So. Just as an aircraft simulator would serve to test and train piloting ability, we can design systems to test, train, treat people under a range of controllable conditions. It's the ultimate Skinner box if you're a student of psychology, a controlled stimulus environment that can represent functional 
everyday places. And since 1994, when VR, clinical VR got its traction really with addressing phobias, people that had irrational fears by putting them in the feared context, since that time, this is a short list of the types of clinical conditions that have been, um, where VR has been usefully applied either as an assessment tool to aid in diagnosis or progress uh, documentation for treatment or the scientific study of these clinical conditions. We'll see some of those in a minute. So starting off with the psych treatment, in the beginning, there was exposure therapy. And this was the perfect match for VR. Okay, putting people that have irrational fears in the simulations of things that they were fearful of and then helping them to gradually approach these things. And as they do it, they feel anxiety, but when nothing really bad happens and they realize it's kind of an irrational fear, all of a sudden you see the fear dissipate and people now can do it and it translates to the real world. So the research, you know, this is quick rationale for exposure therapy. Um, the research was driven since 1994. I mean, the, the, probably the most evolved scientific literature in any VR application area is in mental health and rehab. Uh, a lot of people, even though the technology was a little cumbersome back in the 90s, they still hung in there and did the research because the vision was sound. Um, so these are just some examples. Um, for example, if 1997, you were in Spain, you could go to this lab, if you had claustrophobia, you could go in this room, they close the door in on you, and then gradually move the wall in on you. They had elevators and other, other social spaces and so on. Um, and Fear Heights was another area that got a lot of traction. But the interesting thing about that was that back then, the graphics sucked. I mean, you'd never mistake that for the real world, but people with phobias, anything that has a whiff of what they're afraid of, you know, they get anxious, so to get them across that bridge was something. I'm sure some folks here have tried VR experiences. There's one about the, that movie where the guy went across the World Trade Center where a lot of people won't step out on that tightrope, you know, even though you know you're on solid ground. So it's easy to fool the brain, even with relatively primitive graphics. Here's an example of a, right after that, they decided to build the Marriott Hotel elevator in VR in Atlanta. And that way they could put people in the elevator before treatment and say, go up. And it's like, no way. Uh, then do the treatment, then bring them back and see if there was some benefit, if they would you know, actually do it. Um, again, you'd never mistake it for the real thing. Here's a quick video. You may recognize this guy in here. This is from 1995. Wow. 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 I might have been hamming it up a little for Scientific American Frontiers that was filming it, but you get the point. But technology's evolved. Graphics have gotten better. These are the types of graphics you see with these kind of applications. It can be delivered on a gear, a VR headset, running off a mobile phone. So this technology now is going to find its way into regular clinical practice. And I particularly like this one where they, they take people that really like little kitty cats and also have fear of heights and you have to walk out there and rescue the cat, you know, approach avoidance, you know. Um, but fear of flying, a quick walk through back in 97, that's what it looked like looking out the window at a plane on a runway, the cabin, 99, it got a little bit of an update, you know, 2000, a little bit closer, 2005, a group in San Diego actually built a virtual version of the United Terminal in San Diego Airport. Um, and now companies are producing these things that you can license and you can use in your clinical practice to help people get over um, a wide range of clinical conditions I won't have time to talk about. But I do want to say um, the data is there. We, our group, another group, reviewed all the literature up to 2008. VR outperformed traditional imagination-only therapy and was as good as if you did it in the real world going with your client 
to these places. 2012, got an update by another group, same findings. 2015, this group showed that yes, in fact, what you can approach in VR translates to the real world. So, you know, meaningful changes in real world performance based on interaction in the VR world. So next comes post-traumatic stress disorder, which is kind of an exaggerated or extreme version of these same kinds of anxiety disorders like phobias. And we apply a similar approach where, you know, we address the needs, and there are many needs here with our returning service members, you know. Uh, the, the data is, is quite clear of the urgency of the problem still uh, with providing care to our vets. And, you know, what we, we do know is that a lot of treatments are out there that don't show any scientific evidence of any efficacy. But this kind of exposure therapy where you help a patient, and it sounds like torture at first, but you help a patient to confront and process the difficult emotional memories that they had from their trauma, but in a safe environment with a well-trained clinician, you start to see you know, the anxiety raises when you put them in the environment, but then as they do it more and more and they talk about their experience, they narrate their experience, meanwhile the clinician can adjust everything in real time around the circumstances and make it more and more real and help this process of confrontation and processing. Hard medicine for a hard problem, but the data is there as I'll show in a minute. Um, and so the Institute of Medicine noted this and um, we use VR, the traditional method is imagination alone. We use VR because we can really engage people in their trauma memories, pull up the emotions, get them engaged in talking about things they never talked to anybody before. So here's a little, just a little clip that describes it. The brain mind is a form of virtual reality exposure therapy that combines video game-based simulations with one of the most widely used evidence-based therapies. Making use of the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies, expertise in immersive technologies, and emotional storytelling, BrainMind is a treatment option with appeal for today's digital generation. BrainMind gradually recreates trauma-relevant scenarios that clinicians can use to help patients confront and process difficult memories in a safe and supportive environment. Clinician control panel over there in the lab. The clinician controls everything that goes on in the world, time of day, lighting, special effects, sound effects, and so on, to kind of pace the exposure, customized to what the, the patient went through. Here's, this will show you a little bit more of the types of content. We've got 14 combat-related environments that have different characteristics, and the clinician can make different things happen depending on the needs of the client. Like going through a day, it's not going through my head at night when I'm trying to sleep or when I'm with my wife and the times when I don't want it to come up and me start thinking about it. Traumatic things are not normal. You cannot handle the things that you're sitting about. And this is a tool that has helped me out tremendously. Reliving the worst moments of his life has helped him to move on with his life. I've had that 80% of the flow of his blood, but I think that's pretty much after seeing him doing the things that he's done. So one thing we got to keep in mind is, yeah, it's cool technology, but the technology doesn't fix anybody. It's just a tool to help enhance clinical practice by a well-trained provider. So, I mean, VR is really cool, but it's nothing magical about it. Again, it's just a tool. And the way we use that tool is we give the clinician this control panel and they have a screen where they see what the client is seeing at all times and they can make things happen and adjust things. Very easy to learn, it looks daunting, but very easy to learn. Um, so, real quick, the research, I'm not gonna bore you with too much science, but I wanna show you that the stuff works. That's uh, PTSD symptoms before treatment, at the end of treatment, and at three month follow-up. The first study down at Camp Pendleton and Naval Medical Center um, this was a follow up this is the individual data points, uh, just to show um, 16 of the 20 that were in that study no longer met PTSD criteria at the end of treatment. Um, a follow-up study that replicated that finding, another one that's coming out in December in a major journal um, showing really significant effects when combining this kind of exposure with another psychosocial emotional type um, talk therapy application. So, you know, maybe this is best used in the context of general clinical care. 
uh, to amplify the effects. Um, but you know, regardless, the whole key here is to break down barriers to care. You know, a lot of vets don't want to seek treatment, but maybe you put it in a VR game-like context, maybe you can draw more in and get them to do stuff that can really have real benefits for, for the rest of their life. PTSD is not a life sentence. The first version of it, a primitive four version um, app, went out to all these centers. This is where the new version, the 14 world scenario, that all the stuff we learned with the first version um, applied. And I also want to make a call out to uh, AMD Radeon here. Uh, they, them with Dell and with Valve, have donated systems, full systems, that now we can distribute to VAs that don't have the budget uh, but have the need. And so I want to thank them for, um, for that, that really good effort. Um, now, we've done a lot of things with it, and I won't have time to go through them, but I do want to just mention two areas, because uh, I think they make sense. It's not just about combat-related PTSD. The military has a significant problem with military sexual trauma. So we built out a system that addresses sexual trauma that might happen on bases, but most sexual trauma doesn't happen in the trenches of Afghanistan. It happens around military bases in the States. And we built out a bunch of this kind of civilian content, and more Hitchcock than Hurt Locker, we're trying to create the scenes where these things have happened. We interviewed a lot of people that have had this happen, found out where it happens and how to structure the environment. We certainly don't create virtual reality sexual assaults. We're creating the spaces where these occurred so that people can go back to them and finally in a safe place with a good clinician they trust, talk about what they went through. That's undergoing clinical trials at Emory University right now. Uh, the first, I think, five patients to go through have shown a positive response. We're waiting to see how that study pans out because if it's successful, we've got the civilian content built now so that now we can start to think about civilian translation. You know, war sucks, but the military does drive a lot of innovation and they have with VR. So our goal is to take what they've helped us to learn and helped us to develop and now translate it to other groups that might have a need for this kind of therapy. And one instantiation is a project that we're running with a group in Paris, in Lisbon, in Crete, uh, with students building virtual content for the survivors of the Paris terrorist attacks. There's already been a history of uh, World Trade Center victims being helped by VR in the same format. So now we're trying to do this, no funding, just trying to get the thing off the ground on the backs of students. So, you know, you're basically in the, this is the interior of the Bacalan Theater. And we're about halfway through the development for this. Um, anyway, that goes on. Uh, the attack occurs and so on. Um, okay, a little something different. Assessment and rehabilitation. What happens after a stroke or a traumatic brain injury or a spinal cord injury or an orthopedic injury or a disease process when people lose their functioning? Well, they got to do physical therapy a lot of times. And this is like what they do, uh, you know, when they're in a clinic. And, you know, if I had a stroke and now I was ha having to play with Fisher Price toys to do my rehab, I might feel like, well, maybe there's a better way to do it. Maybe I'm not going to be so engaged or I'm not going to do it at home, which I need to do. So what does VR bring to the table? Well, if you look at what a good rehab task is, you have to have good data-driven diagnosis. You've got to be able to adjust the task in terms of difficulty level, level somebody with an impairment can do and then systematically you know, measure it and make it more difficult and raise the challenge and do it repetitively over and over give the patient feedback while they're doing it, automated, um, and you gotta do a ton of these repetitions, and it's gotta have relevance to the real world. And how do you get people to do it? Well, you gotta motivate participation, and perhaps doing it in a game like Context in VR may actually do that. Those criteria for good rehab tasks are perfectly matched to what VR game technology can support. So, and it also, not to get too far out in the weeds, um, from a neuroscience perspective about brain plasticity, if you look at attention, novelty, and reward, these are things that drive neurotransmitter systems in the brain that foster new growth and furthering connections and brain plasticity that might support getting your functional skills back. Well, attention, novelty, and reward are also you know, elements of any well-designed game. 
Um, so here's an example. This guy is sitting in front of a screen and a camera is capturing him and putting him in his mirror image. And now watch this, a golden moment in rehab right there. Ugh. For that range of motion exercise, getting someone to get engaged in the activity. And this is 2002, it's very primitive, but um, this work has progressed. A number of people have done stuff. One of the first studies in 2005 actually documented with the same kind of system, changes in the brain, oops, hold on, changes in the brain as well as changes, positive changes in performance in this kind of a game-based context. Shifting the camera around a little bit, this is for ankle dorsiflexion with cerebral palsy. You can see the leg there and on the back, they're on their back and the little leg there. The game is to do the, the, the movement of the ankle better and you kick a little monkey up a little higher or a coconut up or whatever. Um, and the cool thing with that, this was with children, they showed doing it in the VR environment, greater range of movement, better control of the movement and more interest and likelihood that they would want to continue to do this rehab on a regular basis. Um, other folks have used more exotic robotic type devices that provide forces and interactions with a variety of everyday activities and games. Um, this group in 2009, these are very positive scores. 20 hours of training in these environments showed significant benefits in performance. Um, our lab has been doing this since 2001 playing with a variety of interfaces. Uh, I'm up here with a digital spirometer for a respiratory task. We're helping you to learn to regulate your breathing in a game context. Various game controllers, AR, um, other applications that you know, we had developed over the years using webcams to track little light markers. Um, but what ended up happening was that Microsoft came out with the Kinect. And this really changed things because this is a 3D depth sensing camera that can track the user at a high enough fidelity and put the user in the environment. And we didn't need all the markers and lights and everything. And we could capture performance and give people feedback on how they had improved over time. Um, and what we did was we built out an, an epic game like in across an island, sort of like when you go to a park and you uh, have exercise stations, you navigate through the park well, you navigate through this island and you have different challenges that pop up that are relevant to the type of rehab that you need to do. So we're trying to bring narrative and game elements to a little bit higher level in this, but sometimes you don't even need that. If you look here, like what we did with that little girl with cerebral palsy, this classic game, Space Invaders, you know, something I, when I was in grad school, it was you can only play in the bars, you know, video games. I lost a lot of brain cells and quarters playing these stupid games. Um, great games, actually. But here, he's, he's moving the missile launcher side to side by shifting his balance and firing like this. Now, in the next second, we can assign different gestures depending on what the patient needs to do those actions. So here, now he gets to use his hand like this to move the missile launcher, it's still firing like this, but we could have them stand and, and kick like that to fire if that was relevant, or whatever body transduction is needed for the rehab to participate in the game. So a lot of power in these technologies, and again, you know, the same thing with this leap motion sensor that can track hand movement, so now you can do first person, eye hand coordination, upper extremity, fine motor, uh, activities in a game-like context. So with that, let me jump ahead here. Um, how much, oh, I'm at, I only got a zero? All right, I got to jump to the very end, <laughs> shit. Well, you have to have me back next year. Let me just take a minute just to do a, a summary at the end here. This is all the stuff you guys are missing here. Um, okay, here we go. Here we go, real quick. So I left out imagination when I mentioned, whoop, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, I better back it up here. All right. I left out imagination in the three eyes because I saved it for the end here. And VR is driving imagination. We're seeing, you know, incredible advances. And, in, you know, if you look back in time, 1963, one of the early uh, head mourn televisions, and, you know, the vision in the 90s was put people in the game or put people in the environment. 
Um, the reality in the 90s was it wasn't so good. Um, <laughs> but what we've seen with you know, Oculus coming out and Facebook pumping $2 billion into it, Palmer Lucky you know, driving that, appearing on Time Magazine, and off he goes. Um, um, it drove innovation and imagination. All these head mount display companies are coming out, augmented reality headsets coming out, Magic Leap, uh, HoloLens, uh, Epson Systems, um, and also interface devices, cool ways that people now can interact with this content in more natural ways. This is great for us because we don't have to build the stuff now for, for mental health rehab and whatever. We can just buy the stuff as a consumer product. Um, you know, people are still going to step backwards every now and then with crazy ideas. Um, but we know that this is catching on when you start seeing things like this and Stephen Colbert showing off the gear. You can watch a Democratic or you can watch the, the last Trump-Hillary debate um, in VR with these, you know, uh, spherical cameras. You know, you got to be careful you don't get anything on you. Um, but, um, you know, you can be there and see it. You know, a lot of hype and also cautionary tales along the way, um, scary stuff, turning a Happy Meal box into a Google Cardboard, you know, whatever. But VR is selling, and it's growing. And um, we're seeing that games are predicted to be the big market, but look what comes in second. So this is not a harebrained idea. This is stuff that I think is going to make a difference, and maybe people will make money uh, doing it. Um, so. That's an example of a company in 1995, the only one. These are companies in the last two years that have sprouted up. More companies in the last two years than in the last 20 have popped up to create this content and make it available. It's exciting for the young at heart, my niece and nephew, playing with the gear when I brought it home last Christmas. I had a fight to get it back from them. Um, but it's not just uh, for the young at heart. I went to visit my mom in Connecticut, and I got, got in late uh, on a delayed flight at 3 in the morning. And I had just gotten the gear, and I go, Mom, you got to try this thing. She was waiting up. So. Eighty-three years old. Thank you very much.